Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. Welcome back to our non-toxic podcast. I'm Hannah and I'm here with episode 81. Woo, pause for studio laughter. Thank you so much. I am recording this at two in the afternoon. I'm running off of two cups of coffee. I was going to have lunch, except for that I forgot, which is not healthy. It's just that I had a meeting over lunch and I hate having meetings and having to eat because then you have that awkward nuance of like, when do I take a bite? Are they going to talk the whole time while I'm trying to chew my food? Or are they going to like expect me to carry the conversation? Then you don't eat your food. Then it gets hard and it's just a whole thing. So I got a coffee instead. Uh, this is the new Urban Grounds Something in the Orange drink. It's an orange mocha. It's so delicious. I usually don't like fruity coffees very much, but this one is fantastic. I will revisit later in my report, but I'm going to go through this kind of quickly because I... I'm on more of a time crunch than usual. Don't worry, we're still gonna yap for the entire hour, but I wanna make sure that I get all the meat and potatoes of the episode and not just me giving my ancillary life details first. Although I do have some things to go over. (laughs) And as you would expect, none of them are important or relevant, but because this is gonna be a more serious episode and I tend to have new listeners primarily with the serious episodes, I do wanna say, if you don't care about the parts that are specific to my life, you can just fast forward like probably 10 minutes maybe 15 and I'll get straight into the actual part of the episode. If you're listening exclusively for that, if you're a new listener and you want to stick around, then you might as well get to know me, get to know what we do here on the pod. If not, it won't hurt my feelings. Just skip to the part that you need and uh, we'll go from there. If you are here to hear about the most um, mundane, not important things, allow me to start on my notes. First of all, I'm about to go into a travel season for, I don't know, the, the last time for the foreseeable future, because I feel like I've just been on the go for the past year ish for perspective. I think I've said this and forgive me if it's obnoxious because it kind of is since last July, I have taken a flight every month except for November of last year. So July, August, September, and so forward, you know how the month system works. I've flown at least one place, sometimes multiple places. Sometimes it's been for weddings or personal trips. Sometimes it's been for family trips. Sometimes it's been for work. It's been just a little bit of everything. So I was thinking about how amazing that is, but at the same time, how taxing it can be because you're always catching up from something. You're trying to get ahead for something else and it's just been exhausting. So I have two trips coming up in the next three weeks. One of them is a girl's trip, which came together so miraculously and kind of last minute, to be honest with you, because I have a hard time committing to things that are that far in the future because one, whenever you're in a season of trying to have a baby, you don't really know what the future is going to hold. So if we're planning something like six, seven, eight months to a year out, Of course, the goal is to not be able to attend some things. So that's led me to be a little bit difficult to get to commit to things over the past few months just because I don't know where life is going to take me. This one came together super quick. It was one of those things where, you know, you're kind of talking about a trip like, oh, yeah, we should do this. And then someone's like, no, we should actually do it. And it happened to work out that everyone looked at their schedule and was like, oh, I think we can actually do it. So we booked this Airbnb and we just are going to Scottsdale uh, tomorrow. I'm not packed yet. I'm not really prepared because I've been so focused on getting everything ready to go because I also had a trip planned to go see my brother for the last time he's in Charleston a week after that. So it's kind of just been crazy trying to get all the work stuff done because if I'm gone, then it's not, there's no one working as it's just me. So I'm trying to do all my shoots, all my meetings, all my consults, everything beforehand so that I can have all my bases covered. And whenever I go on these trips, I can fully be present and enjoy myself because even though I'm able to work remotely, if it's something that I'm really just trying to enjoy, then I'd prefer not to do that. So that is, that's the GP, the game plan. If you see um, just an extreme over, over surge, just an overwhelming amount of content from Scottsdale, once again, just know we are living it up, baby, in the 110 degree heat. Next. I gave blood yesterday and I won't shut up about it. If you can see my arm, it is bruising. 
no shade to any of the phlebotomists that are so generous and give their time and profession to draw people's blood. But this one was just not a good experience and I don't want to gross anybody out or deter them from going. But long story short, there's just a good way to draw blood. And in my experience, and this was my 37th blood donation. So I've done a time or two. The best time that I go and get it done, it's always when the nurse is very decisive and very quick with it. Because the needle is large. It's not small. I won't sugarcoat it. It's like the biggest size needle that they have to do any kind of blood work. Sometimes they leave the cotton square off of the covering and I look over at it and I almost just ascend straight into orbit because it's so jarring visually. But she, yesterday was just very slow with it. And they're, I think they maybe are under the impression that if they go slower, it hurts less. And that's not the case. You just feel more of it and it gives you the heebie-jeebies. And on some different parts of your arm, they can hit a valve, which is the thing that opens and closes to my limited medical understanding, but I, that's what a valve is. So it can make your arm kind of vibrate and make you bleed slower. And usually I'm hooked up to the machine for seven to eight minutes. I'm pretty hydrated. I squeeze the thing like I'm supposed to. I go fast and it's over and it's done. This time I was hooked up for like 21 minutes. It's way too long. My arm's starting to hurt. She's like, oh, sorry, sweetie, you're on a valve. She's kind of twisting it. I'm over here half hanging on. I like to think I'm pretty tough because I've done it so many times, but I still get queasy. And to be completely honest with you, the reason that I started getting blood in the first place is because I have a phobia of needles. So my skewed understanding of how phobias work is if I just face it and do it, I will get less afraid. And for the most part, that's worked. I really am not bothered by needles. Obviously I can get Botox. doesn't bother me. I can get blood drawn for like the little tiny things that you do for your physical. doesn't bother me. Most of the time, donating blood doesn't bother me either. I just don't look at it and I go to my happy place in my head and TikTok. <laughs> I don't think about it. But this one, she was just doing all of the things like they usually try to expedite you, like get you in, get your paperwork, move you along. And it doesn't feel nerve wracking because you move right through and everything is easy. And I don't know if they were just slow and they weren't really in a hurry, but everything felt like it was dragging on. So you have more time to get nervous, more time to anticipate it, more time to like sit around and wait. And then the donation took a lot longer. Now my arm is bruising and I was like, oh, I'm just straight up not having a good time. But there is a critically low blood supply in Springfield. So if you guys feel so inclined and you want to go donate, they give you a T-shirt. They're giving away free tickets to a Springfield Cardinals game. It's a really good cause. If you would like a buddy to go with you, I truthfully will go and hold your hand and make you feel less nervous. I will distract you with a live podcast, i.e. me talking to you. So now every time I look at my arm, I'm getting a little bit nauseous because I, I can handle like the donation itself, but then the bruise and like the weird spot that it's in, I keep seeing it and I'm like, Ugh. so forgive me if I get a little bit pale and queasy and pass out right here on the floor. Also post it. I'm not going to edit that out because we are here for authenticity. Next, busted my lip this morning. So here's what happened. I woke up, had to get up early this morning because I had a shoot at eight and I didn't blow dry my hair last night. I just told myself I would do it in the morning. So I had to get up at like 630 so I could dry it and then proceed to get ready for my day. I get out of bed. I grab this cup here like I always do. I'm walking so stealthily, so quietly from my bedroom into the bathroom, into the closet where I get ready so as not to wake my husband, except for probably around step number eight of the day. I've been up for probably... I don't know, a minute and a half. I shoulder checked the door with the hand I'm holding my cup in. I'm trying to take a sip. The straw jams up into my lip, cuts it open on the inside. I'm bleeding over my tooth. I'm irritated. I was super loud. I woke Austin up, went to the, the bathroom, looked at my lip. It's gross. It's bleeding. It's probably going to swell. So I put some ice on it and hope for the best. I don't think you can really tell that it's swollen, but it is kind of sore. So that was really fantastic this morning. Also good news. I have been having a little shaky car issue where my car shakes tremendously as I break it and go to slow down. And I knew that it was kind of getting worse, but I, I guess had tricked myself into thinking that that's just what all cars do until Austin drove my car. And he said, does your car always shake this bad? And I was like, um, now that you mention it, I, yeah, I guess. And he said, how long has this been going on? I said, uh, ma, mm, two, ma, a quarter of a year, six months. I don't know. He said, take, go ahead and take your car in and get that fixed. So I did go get it checked out and all four of my rotors were in need of grinding or shaping or whatever they do to rotors to make them rote. <laughs> so that was a fun little $700 bill that I got to drop on top of us just paying for our air conditioning. So if anyone's wondering why my roots look so bad, it's because I don't like spending money and I have been doing a lot of that. And they say that bad things come in threes. So I'm thinking there will be another expense 
shortly in my future. And I'm hoping that it's a more minor expense. And we've like, we're kind of on a descending order. We've had the AC, the car, and then now something else, maybe it'll be very small and minor. So thank you to everyone for taking the time to manifest that for me. Next, um, the report moving right along reading. I have this nerdy book. It's the Avengers origin stories as told by the comics. It's like whatever they were written as originally in the sixties. You guys don't care. I think it's cool. Whatever. So I've been reading that and it's really interesting. Next, eating. Urban Grounds, new summer menu. Everything is fantastic. Highly recommend. Not sponsored, unfortunately. Playing. Tennis, obviously. Update on my other bruise. This arm is really just taking a beating. My right arm is straight up not having a good time. But this bruise, if you can see it on um, my inner arm, it's kind of yellowy and just not. It's, it's a beautiful summer hue, actually. It's kind of yellow and green, kind of lemon lime. Very aesthetic. Uh, it's because I was using a men's racket. Turns out there's a difference for a reason. I thought it was just the men's one was blue and the women's was pink. That is not the case. The men's is about four inches longer on the handle than the women's. And it's kind of heavy. So every time I was hitting the ball, I'm holding it in like the place where I have the most control over the racket, which is closer up to the webbing, the net itself. I don't know what I'm talking about, if you can't tell. Which was making the handle smack me repeatedly right in the middle of the forearm, causing it to bruise in a very unsightly way. Now I do have a women's racket. Hopefully the fact that I've invested um, a very minimal amount of money into it does not mean that I lose all interest because sometimes that's what happens. We'll keep you posted. I've also been playing Spotify mixes. I really don't know if I've mentioned this before, but if you listen to Spotify and that's your thing, no disrespect to the Apple Music Girls, but I just think Spotify is far superior. Spotify is like the BFF that you don't even know that you need. If you search on Spotify mix, it will show you all the different mixes that they've created. They have everything from like crazy ex-girlfriend mix to thunderstorm crying mix to goblin core mix. Like there are so many mixes for every single mood that I sometimes will just scroll through until I find one. And if you're in that like weird melancholy state where you can't tell what mood you're in and you scroll through, one will call your name. I found so much good music that way and usually don't like to branch out, but Spotify has earned my trust. So whatever, whatever Spotify tells me is what I will do with my life. Obsessing, Pinterest, self-explanatory. I've just been doing a big Pinterest kick. I think because I have some trips coming up and it's summertime, I've got all these cute Pinterest boards and sometimes I don't like to scroll social media. And I'm also gonna touch on that when we get into the bulk of this episode because it's so personal and you just see people's life updates and everything else. Sometimes Pinterest is just fun. It's it's not quite as overwhelming or as overstimulating as TikTok is. It's not as depressing as Twitter slash X can be. It's just fun. It's just pretty pictures just good vibes. So loving Pinterest as always recommending childlike wonder. This is so sweet. I got a message this week from somebody who replied to one of my stories where I posted about reclaiming childlike wonder this year. And she said that I inspired her to be in constant pursuit of childlike wonder. And what that is to me, I'm no philosopher. Childlike wonder is that feeling of summertime where everything is great. Everything is a new possibility, silly, simple things have the ability to make you joyous and happy and fulfilled and not everything has to be so ho-hum, life is so drab, adulthood is heavy and difficult. It's just doing all the fun things about life and you know, if you wanted to spend the afternoon doing a coloring page in your patio, amazing. If you just feel happy watching one of your favorite movies, amazing. Spending some time with your parents, getting some ice cream. Just go back to that stage when you're like, I don't know, you're younger and the world doesn't feel so big and scary, which I know we can't always fully undo, but we can look for the things that make us happy and not not always wait for something that's so monumental and exciting or expensive to bring us joy. Finally, treating, once again, the new Urban Grounds menu, not sponsored yet. Guys, hit me up. I'm there every single day. We would love to have you as a sponsor on this podcast. Moving along. So this is an episode that I truthfully have been putting off for a long time because I don't want to talk about it, but... It's going to be the follow-up to the episode I released following my miscarriage in November. And to go back a ways, I had a miscarriage. There's a whole episode. You guys can listen all to that. I'm not going to recap the details here because I do not want to. But there's a full episode that's like every single step of the of the process and what happened and, you know, doctor's appointments if you, if you are interested in learning about that. But I wanted to do a follow-up episode talking about, you know, the weeks afterwards and how I've been feeling and what's helped me and things that have, have hurt me and my struggles and so on. And I just have not wanted to bring it back up because I, although I do overshare on the podcast, 
am a pretty private person with things that are more serious like that. And it might seem a little contradictory because yes, I'm sharing it with hundreds of people every week, but this is just me talking to myself in a room. So it doesn't feel quite as scary as something like posting about it on my Instagram story or talking about it in person because that I get instant feedback, instant kind of gratification and you can see people's reactions and it's just, it's a lot more timely than me recording this, editing it and then putting it out tomorrow, having no idea when people are listening to it, what they're thinking about it. And some people do reach out, which is great, but it's not quite as conversational to the point that I would feel uncomfortable having that, that deep of a discussion. And I have wanted to wait enough time to make sure that I have a good enough perspective to where I can look back and see things maybe for how they are and not me being so close to the situation and being so emotional that my opinions can be skewed or, you know, emotions are, are high and low, but at the very beginning of something traumatic, whenever you're, you're struggling to kind of get a grasp on your feelings and get your bearings again, then I just think that sometimes I might read things incorrectly. So I wanted to wait until I was far enough removed that I had a better perspective. And honestly, I've just been avoiding it because I don't like to think about bad things that have happened in my life. And I want to continue to just kind of be silly and happy go lucky and talk about anything but the things that are hurting me. But the reality is that this is a very big portion of my life right now and something that is on my mind about 98% of the time. So it, it's unjust for me to need to heal from it and know that other people have used the previous podcast episode as a resource to heal from their own miscarriages and infertility struggles and trying to conceive journeys and for me to n repress having this uncomfortable conversation just because of my own um, hesitance to do so. And something that I've been grappling with with the last episode, that is far and away the biggest and most um, streamed episode that I've ever had. And I have mixed feelings about that. On the one hand, it's given me so much peace because if God can use my pain to reach so many people, then I have, you know, some some healing because of that. Cause I know there was purpose. There was a reason for me to go through that if it was to help someone else. But on the other hand, I struggle with knowing that that many people have, you know, heard the most vulnerable story of my life and have heard me cry and all these things. And it's just, it's a really, it's a really difficult thing to kind of wrap your brain around because like I said, I record this by myself in my room, but to this day, you know, it's been seven months. I, I get messages, emails, comments on Spotify. I get all of these different women reaching out to me at the very beginning of their miscarriage journey saying, you know, this is happening to me right now. I just got home from the doctor and I was searching for a resource. Yours is the first episode that comes up on Spotify, which is just absolutely humbling for one. But on the other hand, I have so many difficult emotions with that because I don't always like to talk about it. And I, <laughs> I'm going to talk about like five different reasons that this is good and bad, but bear with me. One, I'm so humbled and flattered and honored and so touched by every person that's reached out to me. I've heard from hundreds of women. I screenshot every single message because it means so much to me. And every, every time I start to doubt God's plan for my life and why we're going through this journey, I just go back and look at those and think these people wouldn't have felt heard or they wouldn't have felt seen or they wouldn't have had this resource or even this comfort that they say they got from the episode. If I hadn't gone through this, I can give myself some peace that way. But on the other hand, I have a hard time because if this is what has helped so many women and then I don't continue to talk about it, am I falling short of this calling or falling short of this need or am I not living up to what God is asking of me? But then on the other hand, I don't want to be that person that's a broken record that is completely defined by their trauma or their sadness and I don't want it to become something that rules my life. So I have this constant ebb and flow of feeling so honored to have been given the ability to reach so many people and to use this platform for something that's so significant and then also feeling very you know, kind of exposed and vulnerable about it. And then also feeling like I'm not doing enough, but then not wanting to be that person where it's like, okay, we get it. You went through something difficult. You need to move on. So I don't know. I have a lot of mixed feelings about that, but I do think that this is a necessary episode. It won't be quite as heavy or heartbreaking because I am not feeling quite so heavy and heartbroken, but it's just a lot of my observations, a lot of things that I wanted to address and just talk about because I feel like the conversation is not being had. And even if you're not in a stage where you're healing from a miscarriage, even if you don't have kids or you don't want kids or you have all your, your babies and you don't want to have any more, no matter where you are, I feel like this is just going to be a good episode to listen to because especially as women, pregnancy and childbirth and family planning, everything is all around us. And there's such a weird discourse about what we talk about, what we don't talk about. So I think this should be helpful, even if it only helps you know what to say 
should one of your loved ones or one of your friends go through this in the future? If you have anything to add, if I mess something up, if I, you know, speak out of turn, just know that this is my best attempt to convey my feelings. And this is all obviously based on my own experience. I can't pretend to know what everyone else's experience was like, but these are all straight from the heart and things that I've made note of over the past seven months. And maybe I'll do another follow-up after I've, you know, had some more time between me and um, all of this happening. But for now, this is where we're at. So the first thing that no one tells you about miscarriages, it's how common they are. One in four women miscarry with their first pregnancy. And I had no idea about that. I knew that miscarriages were possible, but I did not know that it was a quarter of every first pregnancy. And what was explained to me with my doctor was that your body has to go through so many changes and so much has to go right for your body to take to the pregnancy and for everything to adhere. And there's already a limited chance that you'll conceive. And then there's a limited chance that the embryo or the zygote, I don't know what I'm talking about as far as the medical terms. So bear with me will be viable and then a limited chance that it will, you know, adhere to your your uterine lining. And then from then on that it will continue to grow like it's supposed to and have no defects and so on. I did not know that there were so many things that had to go into it, probably because you grow up and you live your whole life thinking like, oh, don't have sex. You might get pregnant and you're on birth control and everything is, is very anti getting pregnant, you know, until you're ready. So you honestly, at least I was under the impression that it's something that's so common. It's so easy that, you know, people get pregnant in high school, people get pregnant on accident. This, this just happens all around. So whenever you're trying, you just have to kind of decide and then, yeah, it's going to happen because it's so common. It's so difficult to avoid sometimes. So that was my impression going into it. We were very fortunate to get pregnant basically the first cycle that we were trying. So then I'm of course reaffirmed in my belief system. Like this is so easy. You just decide that you want to get pregnant. It's only a few women that struggle. That's very sad, but it's not me. Then when all of this happened and our doctor was so cavalier about it and he was very caring, but he wasn't concerned in the way that I, I was expecting. I was expecting almost, oh my gosh, what a tragedy, you know, cause I felt like I was grieving the loss of something massive, which I was in that, you know, you're grieving the loss of your first child, your first pregnancy, your first attempt to understand all of these emotions of becoming a parent and I was so early on, I knew for a week, I knew for not that much time, but so much changes in your mind and your heart whenever you're first going through all of those things that I expected everyone to be on that same level of shock and grief and panic that I was. But for medical professionals in looking at the statistics, it's so common. So you're kind of met with this, oh yeah, it happens. You're going to be okay. And I, I, after talking to so many other women who've experienced these, was very fortunate to have great bedside manner from the entire medical team that I was working with. Some people are not that fortunate and that's very, very heartbreaking, but my team was so great and, you know, very conscious of my emotions and gave me all of the encouragement that they could while still remaining (laughs) medical professionals. So you go in and they have to do blood work to confirm, you know, your HCG levels and all your hormones. And then you have to go back in Um, every few days to get your HCG levels checked again to make sure that you've passed all of the tissue and make sure everything goes back down to zero before you're officially cleared. So for me, it took two rounds of blood work um, because I was so early on and I went in after I had already been bleeding for probably a day and a half and we were talking to the doctor on the phone, but they kind of just talked us through it and whatever. You can listen to the other episode if you want all the nitty gritty details. But the next thing that I didn't realize is how painful it is. This was my experience. But I didn't have to have, I know some women have to take different medicines to stimulate the passing of the tissue. Um, I didn't have to do that. I did everything naturally, but it's, it's similar to the worst period pain you've ever had. It's just incredible heaviness, tension, cramping. You feel so nauseous on top of the emotions behind it, like completely factoring those out. It's just one of the most painful things I've ever had to experience. And, you know, you're sitting there and there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can make happen more quickly. You just have to wait it out. And for me, it was about two, two and a half days of very heavy bleeding and cramping and pain. And then probably two or three more days of lighter bleeding. But I was bleeding through the thickest pads. My mom had to go buy me like industrial grade granny panties because I just had nothing that was durable enough to keep the pads that I needed at that point. So It was just very gruesome. And I don't think that that was something that I would have anticipated because again, no one talks about it. Even now I'm like, okay, am I oversharing? 
But let's just hope that the men are not listening to this episode. This is for the girls only, not my 2% male listeners. However, I just didn't expect it to be that jarring. And whenever you're you're already going through these emotions and thinking about what's happening and how sad you are, and then you go to the bathroom and you're bleeding, like dripping blood, it's going down your legs, you're like, it's just, it's scary. And it's the kind of thing that gets burned into your mind. And, you know, you can't unsee some of those things. And even though bad periods, you know, sometimes you look and you're like, how am I bleeding this much? Am I okay? That, you know, is a period. There's something different about whenever you're bleeding and, you know, you get blood on your hands and you're trying to change this pad and you're in so much pain and you know that was going to be my first child. There's something about that that just brings you a level of pain and nausea that I just can't even attempt to verbalize. And, you know, there are still some times that I I get flashbacks to that moment and the first couple periods that I got following the miscarriage were traumatic. I was having, you know, flashbacks and thinking about how sickening that was. And I really struggled with that. And I think that now I've gotten a little bit better of a handle, but it's not fun. And I don't think that, you know, that will ever be fun. And I think that whenever I am pregnant again, I'm going to live in constant fear of that first wipe whenever you look and you see blood and you don't expect to see blood. And it's just the most heart wrenching, heart sinking, breaking feeling. I, I still like, I'm getting chills now just thinking about it, but whenever you're so happy and you're just on top of the world and everything is great and you feel like you're just on cloud nine and then everything comes crashing down with one, one swipe of blood. So I'm sorry if this is triggering for any of you, please don't listen if that's the case. Um, I'm going to skip that one and go back to it. You might not feel feminine. I talked about my struggle to feel maternal prior to getting pregnant in the last episode but this is one of the biggest things that I've struggled with since then is whenever that happens, I, I know there's nothing quote wrong. I know there's nothing defective or broken, but you know, in theory, there could be, there could be something wrong. There could be something that my body's not doing or producing, but when that happens and it happens, you know, inside of what, inside of your body and what you're supposed to feel so natural and able to do, it led me to feel completely defective and not feminine and not equipped to this and not fertile and just made me feel so, I don't know, so broken in a way that, you know, as someone who didn't even grow up anticipating being, a, being super pumped about being a mom, I guess I always saw myself having kids, but I just never felt so connected to that side of me. And this almost felt like an affirmation, like, oh, I really am not cut out for this. My body can't even do it. And you start to have all these very negative thoughts and it just becomes a really toxic place in your mind, I I suppose. So I don't know. It just led me to start feeling kind of like this ogre person walking around and not being pregnant. And then you see these beautiful women who are fertile and who are glowing and look amazing. And you just start to feel like the complete antithesis of that. And I thought that would go away, but I still feel that way. And that's something that I've been struggling with a lot lately is that every single time I get on Instagram, there's a new pregnancy announcement. And every single time I'm talking to someone, it's, oh my gosh, did you hear that so-and-so is pregnant? Did you see that Haley Bieber is pregnant? Oh my gosh, did you see this? My coworker's pregnant. Even today, I had a a content shoot this morning and one of the girls in the office announced that she was pregnant. And that's amazing. And I'm so happy for her. But then it's kind of like, oh, there it is again. And then I went to a coffee shop to do my consults and someone that I know walked in with their brand new, adorable little baby. And then I had a consult with a client of mine who's pregnant. And then it's just kind of constant. And I know that this is the stage of life. I'm in my mid twenties. I'm in the Midwest. This is the time that everyone is popping up babies. And I know that I'm hypersensitive to it. You know, if you're looking for an orange Subaru, you're always going to see an orange Subaru. If you're not, you don't see it. Of course, I never saw this beforehand. And if I did, it was like, oh man, everyone's having babies. But now it literally feels like a knife is being like thrust into my ribs and twisted every single time. And it's almost comical at this point because I swear to you, every single time I open the Instagram app, that's the very first thing. It's that picture, you know, behind the husband's back holding the little ultrasound drop down photos, or it's the little letter board with the the corks and then the baby, whatever coming July, 2020, whatever. And every single time I'm like, oh my gosh, I, then I become that Ben Affleck meme of me holding like a cigarette, just like exhausted. I don't know how to handle that because I know how difficult it is to handle the waiting. So I would never want that for someone else. I know how difficult miscarriage is. I would never want that for someone else. 
But seeing it happen for all these other people while it's not happening for me is very difficult to digest. And especially like the closer people are to you, you want to celebrate them. You want to go to the showers. You want to do all these things. But it just feels so insurmountable sometimes. And it's difficult because I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be resentful. And sometimes that's frustrating because I am. And I don't like those ugly emotions about myself. But seeing it happen for them and not happen for me and wondering why, you know, we're ready and I'm healthy and all these things, why isn't it happening is very disheartening. And it's very, it's difficult because I know with my head, you know, trust in the Lord, God has a plan for us, you know, Romans 8, 28, but it's very difficult sometimes to bridge that knowing from your head and feeling it in your heart. So that's where I am right now. I know all the right things. I know God has a plan. I know that everything will work out how it's supposed to. But the thing is that, you know, how it's supposed to might not be the same as how I want it to. And part of faith is, you know, believing that God is good, even if we don't get the desires of our heart. So that's something that I've been wrestling with is that if we are never blessed with a pregnancy, will I be okay? If we never have a healthy baby, if we, you know, have to go a different route, if we have to adopt, if we have to try something else, will I still have this strong of faith? And that's just such a difficult thing because on some days I can confidently wholeheartedly say, yes, I have faith in God. I know he will work good no matter what our journey looks like. And some days I'm like, I don't want that. I don't want a difficult journey. I don't want to be one of God's strongest soldiers. I want to have a baby the same as all these people who seemingly have it so easy. The people who accidentally get pregnant and the people who, you know, just, oh, we tried, then here's our baby and the baby's healthy. And I also want to say that I know that not every pregnancy is easy. I know that people have so much else going on in their lives. I don't want to seem like I'm trying to compare and be like, well, why does she get to have it so easy? She doesn't deserve that. That's never my intention. Everyone has their own trials and I don't pretend to know what everyone's going through. These are just the things that circulate inside of my mind whilst going through this whole journey. So please hear this how I intend it. It's just very, it's very difficult to see it all the time. And then even whenever I'm having good days where I'm not thinking about pregnancy, I'm not thinking about where I am in my cycle. I'm not thinking about, you know, these cramps I'm having, is this for PMS or is this for something else? Even whenever all of those things are not swirling around in my head, consuming so much of my energy, you you feel okay, you feel fine. And then you see someone's belly and then you see a post on Instagram or then someone brings something up and it's just, it's just hard. So I think that's one of the things that I didn't anticipate is just how personal everything starts to feel. No matter how much you want to be happy for people, it always feels, it's always paired with the sadness for yourself and sadness for your husband and, you know, the fact that our family isn't growing yet. So that's a difficult thing to, to juggle. Um, I don't know how to verbalize this one, but let me try it. On that same vein, I did not anticipate the paranoia that you feel whenever these things come up, you start to feel like everyone's looking at you. Let me give you a metaphor. So I used to struggle with acne super severely back in like the sixth, seventh grade before I really wore makeup. So my skin was just horrendous. It was red and broken out. It was very obvious. And anytime anyone would bring up acne, like even in a health class setting where they talk to you about acne, I would start to feel myself like get nervous and flushed and my heart would start to race. And I'm like, everyone is looking at me. Everyone is thinking about, oh my gosh, they're talking about acne. Hannah has the worst acne in the entire world. And I would start to like hyperventilate a little bit and and just start to feel everyone's eyes on me. Realistically, were they? No, no, probably not. But that's a similar feeling to how it is now because I don't know who knows about this miscarriage and I'm not going to flatter myself enough to think that everyone listens to the podcast and everyone pays attention to it. And truthfully, I don't post about it. So if you don't listen to the podcast regularly and you didn't happen to see those posts that I made announcing the episode back in November, you wouldn't know that I even had a miscarriage because I don't share it on my story. I don't post about these things. I don't talk about it. I don't bring it up. So if someone didn't see that or they're somewhat new to knowing me or following me or they just weren't on Instagram those days, you would have no idea that I've gone through this. So I find myself in a lot of situations where people ask, you know, when are you and Austin going to start trying? Do you guys want kids? And so on and so forth. And there are just sometimes, you know, if I'm around some people that know and some people that don't know and someone asks and then you feel all your friends kind of tense up and see how you're going to react. And then it just starts to feel like you carry the weight of 
hoping no one brings it up, hoping no one accidentally puts their foot in their mouth, hoping someone doesn't say something that's going to hurt your feelings because then not only are you hurt, but then you start to feel uncomfortable because they feel uncomfortable because they said the wrong thing. And it's just so many levels of social anxiety that come with something like this that I don't even know how to really explain that. It's just this paranoia that now every time I'm watching a show and they're showing a pregnancy or a birth or something, you have this weird feeling like someone's looking at you or people are thinking about you. And I don't know, people do tend to put their foot in their mouth quite a bit. And I, I know that's not the intention, but there are just so many things that I don't know. I, there was like one time I was in a car and a bunch of us were driving somewhere and there was a parking spot for, um, expectant mothers, expectant mother parking. And we're driving and someone was like, Oh, expectant mother parking. Anybody here expecting? And it was meant to be a joke, but it was probably a month after I had miscarried. And I just remember tensing up and feeling so sick and like blushing, like embarrassed. Why am I embarrassed that I had a miscarriage that I, it was completely out of my control. I was completely devastated. You made a boneheaded joke. And this individual, (laughs) this individual fully knew what was going on, but then now I have to feel uncomfortable. And then the other people in the car get awkward because they put their foot in their mouth. And then now I'm worried about carrying the emotional distress of every person in the car when I should only be worried about my own pain because why would you make that joke? So it was never intended to hurt me. It was literally just a thoughtless comment, but it's things like that. And then you start to feel so anxious, like, well, I don't want to go to this because then what do people ask me when we're expecting? And for a while, I kind of had a complex, like, I don't want to hang out with anybody because that's just the natural thing. You're just going to hear about people getting pregnant. You're just going to hear about this and that. And sometimes people don't think about it in the way that you receive it because it's not happening in their life. This is the paramount thing that's happening for me right now. This is what I'm you know, tracking everything for, this is what I'm on progesterone for this. Like it's just all consuming. So it's normal for me to have it top of mind. It's not normal to expect anyone else to have it even close to top of mind, even if they know and they're empathetic and they, they are aware of my situation. So even something as simple as talking to someone and having them say, Oh my gosh, I feel like everyone's pregnant right now. My friend just got pregnant and they weren't even trying. It's those kinds of comments made to someone that's still struggling. It, it just feels like, girl, could you not have thought before you said that? But at the same time, I have to remind myself to have grace because this isn't everyone's world. This is my world and this is my journey. And I know that I clam up and don't talk about my emotions all the time. So why would I expect someone to be fully aware of the fact that I'm still in the trenches of my grief and my sadness when I don't talk about it and then expect them to be fully socially aware of everything that might hurt my feelings? I know it's not realistic. And I am much better than I was at the beginning because the beginning I I very much struggled. Um, And that's something else. You don't realize how no one can say anything right. There's no right thing to say. So if you ever deal with someone in your life that is going through miscarriage or infertility or loss, just know sometimes the best thing that you can do is just be there for them and give them a hug and just say, damn, I know this sucks. I love you. We'll get through this. That's it. There's nothing you can say. Because the thing is, when people would talk to me and talk about how, oh my gosh, God has a plan. Everything is going to be okay. I'd be like, I don't want to hear this right now. I just, I just had to watch, you know, this pregnancy, this amazing news bleed out onto my bathroom floor. And now you're telling me that everything's going to be okay. It feels so trivial. And so it feels like it minimizes your issue. And I know that's not the intention. I know that's not how they mean it because no one knows what to say. I'm sure that I've put my, my foot in my mouth hundreds of times, not knowing what people are going through, but that feels wrong. And then when someone is, is talking about how bad it is and how awful and how, disheartening. And then you're like, okay, well, I know why are you making it worse? Even though they're just trying to empathize with you. And then sometimes people will say things like, oh, my sister had a miscarriage and she got pregnant the very next month. That sounds helpful. And at the time that gave me hope. But then what happens is that, okay, well then the first month passes and then the second month passes and then the third month passes. And now I'm seven months later, not pregnant. And you start to think like, well, why did people say that? Because then it gives you this expectation in your head of, well, then my journey will be similar to their journey because they got pregnant right away. So it gives you this false hope. So I would almost discourage anyone from talking about those situations just because everyone's body, everyone's journey is so different that it might end up having the opposite effect because then you start to compare yourself and think, wow, not only did I have a miscarriage, but now everyone else that had a miscarriage is somehow recovering from their miscarriage faster and better than me. And they got pregnant right away and I didn't get pregnant and just leads you down this whole spiral. So 
that's difficult. So it just, I was getting mad at myself because there's nothing anybody could say. If people would call me and check up on me all the time, it was frustrating because I don't want to think about it. And I'm trying to forget and I'm trying to heal. If people wouldn't call and check up, then I would feel like, how could you go on with your life when my world is just ending? If people would come over and try and cheer me up and just be peppy and talk about other things, it would piss me off because how can you talk about, you know, what's happening on TikTok whenever, again, my world is coming to a screeching halt. But then if people would give me those sad, pitiful eyes and be like, hi, how are you? How are you doing? I'd be like, can we not do this right now? Like give me, it's just impossible. And I, I could recognize simultaneously that I was being unreasonable and impossible, but all of those things were how I felt. Everything made me mad. Everything was frustrated. And I, I was almost more angry than heartbroken. I was very sad, but my emotions manifested almost solely with anger. I was angry at people who were pregnant. I was angry at people who were too sympathetic. I was angry at people who weren't sympathetic enough. And I just, every, I just felt so angry at what had happened. So there's just sometimes no win. It's a real Kobayashi Maru. It's an unwinnable test. It's just, there's nothing you can say, but I will tell you that I remember every person that was there for me. And now being, you know, seven months removed, I can look back and say that I was the unreasonable one. Everyone else was just being caring and kind and, you know, they were doing the best that they could. If you are supporting someone who's going through miscarriage, I think just letting them know that you're there is the best thing that you can do. Um, we did get a lot of care packages dropped off and there were a couple things that really helped us. Everything was so sweet and made me feel so loved. But the few things that stood out were the self-care things that people kind of give to you because anyone who's been in any kind of depression or grief mode knows that you just let yourself kind of fall by the wayside. So anything that can make you feel comforted or happy or just a little bit cozy, those are all great. But something that stuck out to me that I wouldn't have guessed to be such a good gift was from a friend who's actually had two miscarriages of her own and has been just the most amazing godsend supporter to me. She dropped off a basket and in the basket, there was this gift of bracket books and it would be like road trip snacks. And you fill out a bracket to determine the best road trip snack, you know, rom-coms. And she dropped that off. And I don't think that she probably gave a second thought to that being in the box. But then Austin and I, I think it was two days after, maybe the night after or something very, very fresh. And we went through and did 10 brackets and we finally like got our mind off of things and we were smiling and it just felt so trivial and silly. But that was the first thing that we had talked about that wasn't how sad and heartbroken we were. That was such a good gift. And I just will never forget how unexpectedly profound that was. So that was amazing. Um, speaking of distractions, something that I didn't know about miscarriage is that sometimes now, especially, I'll have good days and happy days and I won't think about it at all. But then I will be absolutely crushed by a wave of guilt for that. And it's so difficult because on the one hand, I do want to heal and I want to move forward. But on the other hand, I never want to forget. I never want to think that was just a thing that happened and now it's over. But for me, having an early miscarriage, I was not quite seven weeks, then you feel so inferior to women who have had, you know, miscarriages at eight weeks, nine weeks, and so on, who have had stillbirths, women who have lost little babies. You feel like your trauma, while it's the biggest thing that's happened to you, is small in comparison to other people. And no one made me feel that way. That's just something that is kind of ingrained into me. So then one, you start to feel like you don't have the right to be as sad as other people because that, you know, I only knew for a week, how am I this broken up about it? And then you start to feel, you know, did that even happen? Cause now I'm seven months removed. My life by and large hasn't changed. I'm still doing the same work. I'm doing the same things every day. My body hasn't really changed that much in some ways it has, in some ways it hasn't. Things are the same for me. So why am I so broken up about something that I only knew about for a week? And then you start to feel like you're not justified and you start to gaslight yourself and thinking that I should get over this. Am I, am I not healing properly? Am I not doing this right? Am I, how should I have moved on? Do people think that I'm still sad and I shouldn't be? And then on the flip side, if I ever have a good day and I'm distracted and not thinking about it and I, I somehow, you know, make it through the whole day without these thoughts, then I, without fail, it will just hit me out of left fields and I'll be like, Ugh, and it's all over again. Then you start to feel the shame. Like, how did I forget about this? How did I, how am I just moving on and living my life and going to a concert and feeling fine when this awful thing happened to me? And I, it's just this conflicting, it's such a mess. Every emotion is so contradictory and messy and 
it's just, it's very difficult to try and weave your way through this knot that is my, my brain at times. So I don't know. I, I struggle with that. And especially lately because my due date was supposed to be in the end of July. And now I have a few friends that are having babies in July and I'm starting to see all these showers for these people that are having, you know, babies, right? Whenever I was supposed to have a baby and getting close to the due date, it's just very difficult because my life is so different. And on the one hand, you know, our time will come. I'm only 25. I know we have so much time ahead of us, but on the other hand, it's just something so mind bending about thinking like I was supposed to have a big, a big belly right now. I was supposed to have a baby shower. My kids were supposed to be, my first baby was supposed to be the same age as these other babies that are about to be born. And to think about the fact that I was supposed to be five weeks away from having a baby and now being not even pregnant. It's just so sad and so disheartening especially because what I kept telling myself is that we will get pregnant. We will get pregnant. We will get pregnant. And there were so many things that we turned down specifically for the summertime, like things that we, we chose not to go to or trips or whatever else that I've said, no, like I, I, we're trying to get pregnant. I don't know if I can only to now be in June, still not pregnant, could have been able to attend these things and now being like, well, that didn't go according to plan. So I've definitely struggled with that with a timeline because the longer it goes, it's almost more frustrating. Like if you would have told me right after it happened that June would come and we still wouldn't be pregnant, I think it would have crushed me. So God knew what he was doing when he gave us limited foresight. There's a reason that we can't see the future because I think that would have absolutely just broken me even further because the one thing that was giving me hope to keep going is that it'll happen, it'll happen, it'll happen. Everyone says it happens so quickly. You're extra fertile after a miscarriage and so on. But they don't tell you that everything is so up in the air. Some people try again right away and everything is fine. My doctor told me that we had to wait two cycles to make sure everything was good. So it took me a little bit to get my period again. Then I got it. Then we had to wait for the second period. That one was a little bit like askew anyways. And then once I had two periods, I had blood work done to confirm that I was good to go. They said, oh, you're low on progesterone. Let's throw you on that. Put me in a low dose of progesterone. What I didn't know about that is that it would take me three months for my cycles to return after starting to take progesterone because any kind of hormone might affect your body differently. For me, it made me lose my periods for three months and I finally got them back. So then not only did I have to wait two months before we could try again, then I had three months that I just wasn't even ovulating, that I was kind of just bleeding and spotting and bleeding and spotting and having all these hormonal changes and everything else. And I was so frustrated because that that's like five more months that I had to wait. And here we are trying to start our family and we're feeling ready and we're excited. And to have that feeling of helplessness, like, like we can't even, I'm not even ovulating. I'm not having periods. So what can I do? You just feel so out of tune with your own body and waiting is so frustrating. And the fact that you can only get pregnant a few days a month and you have to time it just right. And that you have to track all these things to make it happen. It almost takes the fun and the spontaneity out of trying for a baby because then now it becomes, okay, we have to track this. We have to make sure we're doing this. We have to follow this. And I'm taking the progesterone and it, and it becomes more ritualistic and more regimented. And I don't like that. I always kind of hoped that it would be such a, you know, in, in the movies, as you always hope things are where, Oh, it just happened. And we're so happy. And you have that moment where you're like, Oh, my period's late. Oh, I'm a little nauseous. Maybe I should take a test. Girl, that is not even close to how it's going to be. Cause now I'm so hyper aware of everything happening in my body one, one tiny thing that's out of place. And I will take a pregnancy test. And honestly, I've had to stop buying them because I, I will talk myself into it and I'll be like, Oh, maybe not, but maybe, but maybe not. And I would just take a pregnancy test and you can only get so many negatives, even when you're not fully convinced that you are before you just start to break your own heart again. So I stopped buying them. And at this point I'm like, I'm not taking a test until I have genuine symptoms until I'm genuinely late and everything else, because I'm just going to get my hopes up and then be sad. And then it's a whole thing because, you know, the past couple of times that I've taken a pregnancy test over the past four months, when I talk myself into thinking that something is a symptom, inevitably you take the test, it's negative, you get on Instagram, you see somebody's pregnant. It's just like salt in the freaking wound and I can't make myself go through that. So we're not buying pregnancy tests again until I have almost something glaringly obvious because I need to rein myself in. Um, next, the bond that you have between other women who have experienced loss is so beautiful and so cherished. But at the same time, I have this feeling of guilt and I know it will be amplified so much more if I get pregnant prior to girls that have been waiting for longer than me or prior to my other friends trying to get pregnant. And then it's this weird sense of, I don't know if it's just me that feels this way, but it's this weird, it's not a competition, but whenever you have a lot of friends that you know are trying to get pregnant around the same time, 
and someone else gets pregnant before you, it feels like, oh, well, she's a better woman than me. She's more feminine than me. She's healthier than me. All of that is complete bullshit. Your, your value as a woman is not determined by your ability to get pregnant or your ability to bear a child at all. But it's such a weird thing that my mind does to me where when someone gets pregnant, I'm like, oh, she must be healthier than me. She must be superior to me in some way. You know, it's it just, it's so difficult to keep those negative thoughts at bay. And then on the, on the flip side, I, I know, especially with some of my friends that have been so instrumental in my healing journey, that if I get pregnant before they do, I know that I will just be wrought with guilt and not want to tell them and feel so heavy. So as much as I've been praying for my own journey and my own, you know, pregnancies and everything else, I'm praying so hard for them too, because I don't want to have that happy news without getting to share it with them. And man, that's just difficult because you can't tell God how to distribute his miracles. And as much as I want one, I want one for these people that I love so much. And it just, it's very difficult. Um, additionally, I think the biggest struggle, the biggest kinds of grief that I've been dealing with are it's two, two separate types. One is grief for the loss that the life almost was the, the grief of this was supposed to be our first child. We were supposed to have a baby in July of 2024. We were supposed to have a, a Leo baby. We were supposed to have all these things. And it's grief for this baby that you never got to know, but you somehow personified because that's what you do when you find out that you're pregnant is that you start to think a million miles an hour and you start to think about every single thing. And then you, you mourn that specific life. And then the other half of the pain is fear that you might not be able to get pregnant because every month that passes, the question still is looming over me. Will I be able to get pregnant? How long will this stretch on? Is there something wrong with me? What's our journey look like? How long am I going to have to wrestle with these emotions? So it's like the grief and the fear just absolutely beating down on you all the time. And it's difficult because there's different, I don't think that I'll truly ever get over the fear until I have a baby and I will never fully get over the grief. So you have these constant things where even time, it dulls the wound a little bit and it starts to kind of scab over and scar, but I'm always going to have this like gaping, the gaping wound to my, to my heart, which is very difficult. Um, there's also this thing that I kind of, I feel like I've projected onto people that people are waiting on me, especially things like we take a family vacation with my husband's family every year. And we usually take it in January right now. No one can plan anything because they're kind of waiting to see what's going to happen with us. And no one has made any comments about, no one has put pressure on us. No one has made me feel any, any certain way besides what I have manufactured in my own mind. However, it is very real that I know that they're waiting on me and they can't plan it because of me. So for people like my sister-in-law and my brother-in-law that are completely independent to our journey of trying to conceive their whole <laughs> plans and this and that, it all, de it's determined by us. And then you feel this pressure on my body. Like, I feel like I want to look at my you know, uterus and be like, girl, get it together. Like people are, the people are waiting, but you can't. And, and then it's just this weird feeling of disconnect with your own body. And Honestly, I feel like that's why fitness has been such a safe place for me because that I can control and that I can, I can make my body do what I want it to do. I can control how much I'm running and how hard I'm working out. And it's almost a way of reclaiming this connection that I've always kind of had with my body where I want to be proud of it. And I want to be proud of, you know, what it can do and how healthy I am. And that is something that I've been grappling with whenever it's not doing what I want it to do. Like the one thing that I'm praying for and desperate for isn't happening. So it's been a little bit therapeutic for me to kind of throw myself back into fitness even more than usual. And then use that and say, I am connected to my body. I do love what she can do. I love what I'm able to accomplish. And even on the vein side, like, okay, well, if I can't be pregnant and feel feminine and feel, you know, glowing and ethereal and all of these things, then, which I know there are pregnant women listening that are like, honey, you're not going to feel pregnant and ethereal. You're going to feel sweaty and crampy and not good beside the point, let me live in my delusions right now. Part of me so badly wants to have that, that big belly and, you know, be growing and changing and all of that. And that's not happening. So, you know, forgive me if I'm taking swimsuit pictures, because if that's what I get to be proud of right now, and that's, what's helping me heal and, you know, love my body, even though it's not doing what I want it to do more then that's what's healing. Like, that's what's healing for me right now. And it's not that it's vanity, but in a way it is because I could hate my body for what it's not providing me right now. And what it's not able to accomplish, or I could love my body for the things that it is able to accomplish. And that's what I'm really trying to focus on right now is the things that, that I've survived so far and the things that my body has allowed me to do and the things that I can still do and all the blessings around me. So I don't know. It's just, it's very, very difficult to kind of 
articulate that as with all of these things that are so delicate. But last but not least, the thing that no one told me about miscarriage that I just did not anticipate is how gut wrenching Mother's Day would be. And I did not know how hard this would be for me. I had never seen Mother's Day as my holiday because I had, I was never trying to conceive. I was never trying to be a mom. It was just a celebration for the moms of my life. But between last May and this May, you know, we started trying in October at a miscarriage and, you know, late November, it was a whole, a whole catalyst of change for me as a person. And I didn't think about it. Mother's Day weekend came this year. My husband was out of town. I ended up getting food poisoning and I was really sick anyways, but I didn't realize how much of a personal pain it would be to get on Instagram and seeing all of these friends of mine and these women, everyone being celebrated and thanked by their husbands and praised for being an amazing mom. And then how inferior that would make me feel as somebody who hasn't been able to cross that bridge yet. And to see, and, and don't get me wrong, all of the moms in my life deserve so much love and celebration. They, they a thousand percent deserve everything on every day. It's not that it's just, you start to feel so forgotten because you you want to be a mom more than anything. And to see everyone else with their beautiful babies and being celebrated and brought flowers, and I'm over here not able to be celebrated because my body couldn't do what I wanted it to do. And I know I keep saying my body couldn't do this, couldn't do that. That's how it feels. I know, I know realistically, this is just what bodies do. And it's a lot easier for me to give comfort to someone else and tell them, your body didn't fail you. This is normal. You can't help it. It is in no way a reflection on you. But when you're talking to yourself, you just don't tend to be as loving. And sometimes I have to kind of dissociate and give myself the advice that I would give to someone else because I tend to be more compassionate that way. So I hope that you hear this, all of this in the way that I intend it and not in the way that I feel because my feelings can be very harsh. So if you are listening and you're going through this, just know that I'm praying for you too. I don't have any, any of the answers. I'm still in the thick of this waiting season with you guys. Um, if you want to talk about it, I can't promise to have the best advice, but I can promise to listen. So if you if you need advice on how to help somebody in your life or how to talk to someone that's maybe walking through this very difficult journey, then please reach out. I mean, if there's anything that can come from this that's good or healing, then I would love to be able to be a part of that. But for now, I will continue to be completely transparent with you guys, even though it makes me a little uncomfortable, but I hope that this is, has made some sense. I have been dreading it for a long time, but I just know I wanted to get this out there and, and hopefully, you know, help somebody or help somebody help somebody. So thank you for listening. If you've made it this far, sorry, this was a little bit of a downer of an episode. Um, I will give you some fun ones coming up. Thank you for allowing me to be myself and to be completely honest and for me to heal through this microphone and through talking to you guys. So I love you so very much. Have a wonderful rest of your week. I hope you have all mountains and no valleys. And I hope you treat yourself tomorrow on Friday. Love you guys. Bye.